if you go a little bit to history of genetic manipulation, and I have been very interested for a long time in this for the last 40 years, um, was how do you learn about development, about genes which drive development, and when things go wrong in diseases? So, of course, mutations in, in some genes. How do you learn from this? Now, historically, people made mouse mutations. It was Much of this work was done in mouse, um, which arose spontaneously in the laboratory, or they were induced by irradiation. And you see very interesting phenotypes, diseases, but you didn't know what the gene is. That was very difficult before the genomic area. So the first breakthrough was, and was in the 70s, when people in my lab was the first one to do that, to introduce genes into an early embryo to make transgenic animals. So those were animals which carried new genetic information in all of their cells, including the germ cell. So they would transmit this to the next generation by Mendelian um, expectations. Now you suddenly could now design mice in some way you could express a gene. But more importantly, you could mutate genes because these elements would end up somewhere in the genome. You couldn't, at this stage, that was in the 70s, you could not predict where it ends up, somewhere. But it could end up in an important gene and disrupt the gene. So you get a mutant phenotype. So you had, like before, you had an interesting mutant phenotype, but now you could get the gene because your foreign DNA marked the gene and you could clone it out. So that was called insertional mutagenesis, and people really started to make these. Many people in the 80s did this. But the problem here was still, it was random. You couldn't predict where you go. The, I, did, I used a lot of viruses to do this. The virus chose what I would work on. That was not so good, right? And then came embryonic stem cells, were discovered in the beginning of the 80s, and homologous recombination from Mario Capecchi and Oliver Smithies. So they designed methods to predict what gene you want to mutate. It's, by homo it's called homologous recombination. So you could now design mice. You wanted to make a mouse with a mutation in, let's say, the collagen gene, which I made by viral insertion, which makes a very, uh, very serious human disease, like brittle bone disease. Osteogen is called osteogen is imperfecta. No, you could design that. I got it by chance. No, you designed it. So that was immediately a breakthrough. So in the 90s, people made designer mice. And that drove biology ahead. So the key was you could make an embryonic stem cells a mutation. It's a rare event. You have to select the right cells for the rare event. And from these embryonic stem cells, you could make mice. So designer mice were now on the table, and that has really advanced science at an unprecedented, developmental biology at an unprecedented um, um, a pace, and really have, has percolated all parts of, of, of biology. I mean, for uh, pharmacology, for uh, developmental biology, for cancer uh, research, for uh, neurobiology, everybody uses transgenic and knockout mice. Mutant mice. So that was really interesting. That was, it's a standard procedure, so we do this a lot. So when human embryonic stem cells were discovered um, in the late 90s, the first cells were, discovered, uh, were isolated by Jamie Thompson, that was great. Now we could do it with human cells. But what really was puzzling and was a bit, uh, a bit disappointing, homologous recombination did not work in human cells. That was puzzling. Why not? And people scratched their heads, right? And including us, because we wanted to work with human embryonic stem cells and we wanted to genetically manipulate them. So that was really a hold back the field. But then came some very um, imaginative uh, new technologies were developed, where it was a combination between proteins which you would design, designer proteins, which when you put them into the cells, they would introduce a single 
double strand break in the DNA. I want to go into how you do this. Zinc finger um, nucleases or talon nucleases. I can later come to the talons. So zinc fingers are parts of transcription factors which bind to specific sequences. You can design those, you fuse them to a nuclease, which then makes a cut. So you have a specific cut. Now you can at the same time put in the cells a plasmid, which has homology to the two ends where the cut is in the middle. And now the interesting thing is, do we do the repair process, which occur then when you have a double uh, strand break, this sequence will now insert precisely at this cut. So now you can suddenly begin to, and this worked. It was really amazing. It worked. So now suddenly we could, um, we could generate um, mutations in human embryonic stem cells and in iPS cells. The problem with the zinc finger approach was zinc fingers are very difficult to de design. You had to buy them. Sangamo, by a technology, a biotech firm in California, developed the technology and sold it to, to Sigma. And Sigma sold it to, to, to people, but for $25,000 a pair. It was outrageous. So then comes a really clever thing. Then uh, some plant biologist figured out that certain plant pathogens, when they want to invade a plant, they want to change gene expression in the plant up or down to make it better for them to grow. And they do this by a DNA binding protein which binds to specific sequences. And this is a very modular protein. And then these guys figured out we could use it, we fuse it to a nuclease, and we can use that now to, 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 to target a specific sequence, and the nucleus cuts in the middle. The advantage was it worked. We showed it. It works as well as the zinc fingers, except you can design them in the laboratory in, um, in five days. And Sigma dropped its price to $4,000, I think. So I think there, there, saw, um, there was a problem. So, so, so I think competition is really good in science. So the zinc finger technology now gave us the possibility to really design mutations and make now cells. So when you have, for example, a Parkinson patient, we know sometimes Parkinson's are caused by a point mutation in a specific gene. So nuclein, for example, is one. So you have a single base pair change, and you will get Parkinson with early life, 30 years or so. It's really devastating. So it's a single point mutation. So what we would like to make now a model of that, where um, one, one, one could use this, but we would like to have a good control. It's called an isogenic control, where we have a pair of control cells, which are wild type, and another pair of disease-specific cells, which only have this one base per exchange. And the talents allowed us to do this. So at this point, I think the, the problem which made it so difficult to work with human embryonic stem cells and with human iPS cells when we wanted to make genetic manipulations, I think that is largely solved. So I feel um, this is a major, major technical um, advance to um, um, and to make the system useful for uh, disease research and for all sorts of other purposes. So in the, in the 90s, there was enormous opposition. How could you use human embryos to make embryonic stem cells, right? And it was a raging debate, and the argument was, you can't do that. Of course, embryonic stem cells you make from embryos which are left over from in vitro fertilization. So the couple got their baby, they in general make more embryos than they need, and know what to do with these. They're in the freezer. And you can either now freeze them, keep them frozen, destroy them, or use them for research. And some couples chose to give them for research. I think that's the right decision. Other people think it's a wrong decision. And the Catholic Church has, of course, a very uh, clear position on this and so on and so forth. The, the whole debate about embryonic stem cells really has, has a long history in the 90s. Um, and I think it was ex exemplary demonstrate how to solve this by Britain. Great Britain did that. They went through this and said, how long can you manipulate a human embryo? That's the question. When is it ethical, when it's not? 
And they came to the conclusion, as long as the embryo is not implanted in the uterus, under very well-defined conditions, yes, one can use it for research. Once it's implanted, you should not touch it. I believe this is the right decision. It was very well, this process was, then, was law in Great Britain. Um, many countries have adopted it, others have not. So the generation of embryonic stem cells from embryos still is controversial for some. I believe we need to do this, and I have no, no ethical problem here. The IPS cells have solved that problem because they don't involve an embryo. So nobody can, in his right mind, object to that. Some people do still, but I think, that is, um, I think that's a weak position. So the, the ethical problem has been resolved. But what is clear, I believe we need new human embryonic stem cells from embryos because we have to know what is the gold standards, standard to, make, to compare our IPS cells against. So I think temporarily, at least, we would need new lines, and we're making new lines from human embryos um, for that purpose, um, to, to, to really get the standard clear what is a good IPS cell. So if I look at the whole picture, the having IPS cells has solved, to my opinion, totally the, the ethical um, 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 uh, objections of people who didn't like to have um, um, work with embryos, it has solved the problem of nuclear transplantation. So um, when you think you want to make patient-specific embryonic stem cells, before you would do it by therapeutic cloning. You would use skin cell of a patient, put it into a human egg, and make a patient-specific embryonic stem cell. Now, human eggs are even more rare to get than human embryos, because an egg there's no purpose for the donor, for the woman, woman uh, to give an egg. It's not for her own purpose. To give an embryo, she gets a baby. So that's really, there's, a, there's clearly a, um, a, a, a goal um, a, and in, which makes it, makes it worthwhile. To an egg is something else. So it's much more difficult. IPS cells have solved that because you can make no patient-specific IPS cells without using eggs. Right. So that's, I think, is, is, is a very important part. So I think the ethical issues are... Well, the genetic manip manipulation is a, a major a basis for solving what I think is the un most unresolved issue, that's differentiation. So, for example, it's no rather straightforward to, if you want to make neurons from iPS cells or from embryonic stem cells, you want to learn what is a good protocol. It's a very complex protocol. And you want to isolate the right cells at each stage. How do you do that? Well, what you can do is you can insert, by genetic manipulation, insert a marker, a um, green fluorescence protein, into a key transcription factor gene, which gets activated at a certain stage you're interested in. Then these cells become green, and you can fuck sort them. Or you can optimize how you get more green cells or more efficiently green cells. And you can put a red marker a red fluorescent pr um, protein into a gene which is only expressed in the mature neurons. So you go in the same cell, first green, then red. This, I think, will really be helpful to define protocols for differentiation. So that's one application which I think is obvious and, and, and is, is being used. The other one would be to correct genetic mutations in patients in patient-derived cells, not in the patient itself. But then you could put these cells back into the patient. That, I think, would be another possibility. So, um, um, and again, genetic manipulation is the key to, to, to do that.